speaker today. He's a good friend. Uh, met him a few years back, and God has put our hearts together, and we, we kind of out of the same mold, I guess. Um, Pastor Bob has, has been a true friend and a, and a true man of God that he's done so many things and pastored some, uh, a couple of churches and uh, I believe did a building program and got a school together and everything. So he has a lot of experience. So if, when God moves us to the next phase, I know who to tap into right over here. And his beautiful wife, Elaine, we just love her to death and we just love them. Give them a good welcome as Pastor Bob, you come and minister. Take your freedom this morning. Um, let's keep the kids here so they can hear. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if I'm on. Yeah. Every time I get one of these kind of microphones, I feel like a big time evangelist. It's a privilege to be back in this church and to worship with you, uh, the song you just sang, I, I too always look for confirmation when God lays them, uh, on my heart and I was listening, being part of the worship this morning and I'm saying, come on God, <laughs> I know you've given me a word, but you know, so um, your words actually, uh, there was a confirmation there that I needed to hear from, from the Lord and uh, so I know I'm in the right place this morning. It's it's really a privilege to be back uh, here. I think um, Pastor, your pastor, Pastor Bob and, and Linda, uh, we, well, how long have we been friends? Two or three hours? <laughs> um, it, it, it just seems like God put us together. Now, I need, I need to let you know this. I've had the privilege of 50, 55 years in the ministry. I just celebrated uh, last month my 47th birthday. <laughs> and I will tell you that um, a few years ago, four now, I, deci I decided, now you, you, you'll hear a little bit more in, in a minute, I decided it was time to take my ease. After 55 years, you know, being a pastor is not an easy job. You, you'll learn that. Uh, ministry is not easy, especially today. And there's been a lot of changes that have taken place. So I figured after 55 years, I was tired of dealing, you better listen to this, I was, I was tired of de dealing with Christians. It was easier for me to deal with sinners. That's good preaching, <laughs> Pastor. <laughs> um, so I decided it was time. And so I shared that with my wife. She wasn't 100% for the idea. She said, what are you going to do? I said, buy a comfortable lounge chair and a big screen TV, and I'm going to take my ease. And so I resigned our church that we started, and I bought the lounge chair, and I bought the big TV, and three weeks later, I was bored. When I went into the ministry, I started as an evangelist. That was the area that, and my ministry has always been evangelistic. And um, so after some time, God began to deal with my heart and speak to my heart uh, once again about evangelism. But I have to tell you that I was, um, I've had some concerns on my heart for a long time. When I was here, or we were here, I think it was last year, when we were here, I shared with you a story about a heart attack that I had and how I went to be with Jesus and walked with him for eight minutes. And he told me I had to come back because he had, he had given me a message. And that message was is to tell my church that my return is imminent. And so for the last few years now, as God opens doors of ministry, we have been traveling around giving that message. Three years ago, we went to Russia for uh, some missionary work that literally changed my heart in the direction of, our, of, of really our ministry. I don't think I have ever been as touched and, and moved 
by that particular experience. And I came back realizing something that I had been feeling in my heart for a very long time, that the American church is in trouble. There's no other way, there's no easy way to put it, is that the American church is in trouble. And when we were in Russia, I saw a church that has nothing compared to what we have. The average income of the people is $200 a week. They have nothing. They live in poverty. Very few of the conveniences that we take for granted. We have one or two cars that we go to work with and take care of our business with, and they have a thing called two legs that they walk all over the place in. But they had something that the American church has lost. Most American churches have lost. They have Jesus. I don't think I have ever in my lifetime, and you've come close today, where I don't think in my whole life I have, I have witnessed the purity of the worship that they had. Because when they got through worshiping, you were not just in the presence of God, you, you could sense and feel Jesus standing right there with you. It was something that was... And when I asked the pastor what that was all about, because it touched my heart so deeply, he said, we have nothing but Jesus. Wow. Quite a statement, because that's where we used to be in our life. When we were in Arizona at a missions conference uh, this year in February, just a few months ago, God gave me a second wake-up call. It was during the first night that I was there that I was struggling with something internal. You know, preachers have struggles that we go through too. And I was really struggling. I wasn't, I was not, uh, I'm trying to think of the right words. There's no simpler way to say it than I was angry in my spirit at a situation that had taken place. And when and now this is just me. When I get to that place, you see, I can't effectively minister because if my spirit is at is troubled, I can, I can't. This is me. I can't get into the pulpit and preach because there's something that's not connecting right within me. And I was scheduled to preach the next morning at this conference. And the very first night, I know uh, pastors were there and. I'm going to explain what I'm going to say in a few minutes. Gigi was there. <laughs> Pastor Kemp, who was the main speaker of the evening, I, was, I went to church that Sunday night, the first night. And I was, I was getting ready to tell Pastor Grosvenor, the head of the conference, that I would not be able to speak on my time slot the next morning because of what I was feeling in my heart. Brother Kemp walked down off the platform as he was preaching and started the preaching. I was sitting maybe three or four rows back, and he walked up to me, looked me right square in the eye, not knowing a clue of what was going on. And he said, Preacher, put his finger right in my face. He said, Preacher, let it go and let God handle it. And it was at that moment that I looked at him. You see, my wife had been telling me that for a while, let it go. <laughs> but it took a man. <laughs> and when I let it go, I immediately sensed a release in my spirit and the freedom of his Holy Spirit that once again released me to do what he has called me to do. Now, why? The, we enjoy coming to this church. My wife would move here tomorrow. And... Uh, and I noticed this morning, I'm an observer, so be careful. I don't like to go shopping with my wife or anybody else, but when she insists that I go to the mall with her, I'll buy an Aunt Annie's pretzel, sit down in my place, and watch all the other people do what they do. I observe. And I observe something about this church. I've observed your pastor and his wife, and the years that we've been friends. I can sense and feel the presence of God. It's, it's real here. Now, I say that 
because I called Gigi, because when she was in Arizona, just as I, as I look at her face, uh, I can sense and see the presence of God. And so what does Gigi mean? God's glory. And you see, I saw that this morning on the worship team. I observed Pastor as he was leading us in our worship today, and I observed those that are around here today. And I want to say this before I minister this morning. That's more important than anything else. And you, and you will understand in a few minutes the direction that we're going this morning because without him, we are absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, you know, God is good to all of us. And he continues to give us the strength where we need strength. And I believe this with all my heart, that we are living in the closing days of time. I know it for a fact. And God's coming back for a church that's without spot or wrinkle. I've been a student of prophecy for a lot of years, end time prophecy for a lot of years. And, and you need, I want to say this to you this morning, that there is enough prophecy that has already been fulfilled in God's word where Jesus is able to come back right now. Right now, enough has been done. You'll say, what about the rebuilding of the temple? We're not going to be here when that happens. <laughs> the way I believe, we're going to be raptured before that takes place. So I'm not worried about whether it gets built or when it gets built. It's going to be built. The materials for it have already been gathered and are stored. And that says to me that Jesus is coming back again. So you are a church, in my observation, that is doing what God wants you to do. Keep that up. Because Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And there's a price to be paid for that. We need to understand that. Great moves of God don't come just because we have good worship or fast worship or whatever else we want to call it. It comes from a heart that wants Jesus and to move on. So I've chosen for my text this morning. And you can turn there, I'll, we're, we're not going to read it just yet, but, but Matthew chapter 16, two verses of scripture that are very familiar to all of us, verses 17, verse 18 is the, the, the main scripture that I want to minister to. So let's pray before we look at the word. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have today of being in your presence, and we recognize that your presence is here today. We give you all the glory and the honor for that. And Father, we pray as we look to your word today that you will not only anoint your servant, but touch the hearts and the ears of your people that would receive the word that you have for us today. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I started to say when we were in Arizona, the message that I received from the Lord was happened just about three weeks ago, I have an early morning time that I pray. Usually it's at 4 o'clock in the morning when the Lord wakes me up, even if I go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, which sometimes happens. 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm wide awake, and that's my prayer time. I've taken literally that scripture that says, lay before the Lord. <laughs> They're not, I usually get up and go down to, to my office area and, and, and pray down there and put the headsets on, listen to... My daughter, our daughter calls it soaking in, uh, in, with the good music. And uh, that's my prayer time. But when I was in my prayer time just about three weeks ago, and I was praying for the Russian church specifically, God touched my spirit in a very powerful way. As a matter of fact, I, I was sitting on the little couch that's in my office, and I, I, I sat up with a, with a start because I actually heard his voice speak to me again. And he said these words. He said, five years ago, I gave you a wake-up call when I went to be with him in heaven for those eight minutes. And he said, this morning, I'm telling you, wake up my church. His exact words, wake up my church. So I'm coming here to you this morning, not with a sermon, but a message from God. And with the help of the Holy Spirit and on assignment from the Lord this morning, I'm here to share with you what God has given to me for the church of America. I want to make a statement to you from the very beginning, and I wrote it down as God gave it to me. 
And it says this, I will not attempt in any way to rewrite my theology to accommodate a tragedy. Now, what is that? I believe the greatest uh, of tragedy in America today is the deterioration of the American church. We were once a powerhouse for God. And today, I shared with your pastor just a little while ago, I did some statistical background uh, about two weeks ago on the, on, on the decline in the church. Now listen to this. Since 2013, through the first four months of 2017, 27,572 churches have closed their doors in America. 27,500 churches have closed their doors in America. Now, don't misunderstand. There are other churches that are being started, but, but the closures far outnumber those churches that are starting. There's something wrong with the American church. When Donald Trump ran for president, he ran on Make America Great Again. And the reason why America slipped in our status in the world is because we took God out of the picture. And I'm convinced today that the reason the church is in decline today is because we have taken God out of the picture. I meet with some pastors, and believe me, I have no clue as to why they asked me to come and speak for them. They're of a major denomination, uh, UMC. Very liberal. They don't believe that the Word of God is the in, any longer the inspired Word of God. They don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ. They don't believe in the Trinity as we believe it. They don't believe that this book, this Word, does exactly what it says it will do. I don't even know why they exist. They have adopted all the worldly standards. And they are one of the American churches today that ordain homosexuals to their pulpit. You see, I believe there's going to be a purification process that's going to start, that's going to start in the church. I believe that the church has to become pure again. And I believe the purity is going to start in the pulpit. And I believe that God will remove those that are not tuned in to him and what this is all about. And I believe that because the word says that in the last days and be, and be assured that Jesus is coming back and he's coming back soon, but his word also says that in the last days I will pour out of my spirit. And I'm looking for that kind of a move of God to come down. And, and if I want success in the ministry, if I want to see churches grow, I will not change my theology on the word of God to accommodate growth. I would rather have two people that mean business with God than a church full of people who are going to hell. I don't know any plainer way to put it than just that. I have observed over the last several years the decline in the church. And I fully realized for the church to become what God wants it to become, that change needs to take place. It's not always the way we used to do things that's going to work, but we, if we get a hold of God, if we know what he wants to do, and we take the word of God that's precious to us and is strong to us, and we stand on the principles of this world the weak and change as a church, but we don't ever compromise the word of God because it's the word of God that gives us the power and the strength. You see, I'm a firm believer that the church of Jesus Christ must never compromise the power of God. This morning, I want to address some things that I feel will help us to understand where we are in the body of Christ, the things that are going on around us, to help us focus on where God is leading us and what God is trying to do through us. Matthew 16. It 
Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bartholomew, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm here to proclaim something to you this morning. I am not afraid of Satan. I am not afraid of the devil. I am not afraid of hell because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I have no, I have all the authority that the word of God will give me to stand firm on my belief, to rebuke the devourer. He has no business inside of us. We are the church of Jesus Christ. This is nothing but a mere building. We are his church. And when he comes at us, and he will come at us, I say to him, Back up, buzzard breath. I've got victory here. (laughs) Those words, I will build my church. Bob Yenyon once said, you can take those five words and speak power through each one of those five words. And you can put the emphasis on each one of those words. For example, we as a preacher can get up and say, quote that scripture, I will build my church. And we can put the emphasis on the word I, or we can put the emphasis on the word will, or we can put the emphasis on the word build, or we can put the emphasis on my, or we can put the emphasis on church. But if you put that together, you write those sentences out and put it together, there's an angle that comes down that says, under the power of God, I will build my church. And I want us to understand that if we as preachers, and it has to start with us, if we as preachers will determine to build his church, his way, we will see a great move of God in our country. Every one of those five words has a powerful meaning, but the whole concept of what Jesus was saying can be summed up in a few words, and it is this. This church is not my church, it's his church. This is God's work. This is God's church, and this is God's program. And he is going to stand behind this, uh, us to see where it's going to go. We need to recognize that. This is God's ministry. This is God's church. Pastor, when you go back home under the anointing and the power of God, those people, those villages that need Jesus under the anointing of the Holy Spirit will find God, will find Jesus because it's not your church. It's his church and he will honor his word and the church of Jesus Christ will be built. Hallelujah. A few years ago, God said to me, and I'm not against anybody who says it, the opposite of what I'm going to say. God spoke to my heart, and he said this. Stop saying this is my church. We go to preacher's meeting. How's things going? Well, my church is doing great. Stop saying my ministry. Now he's talking to me. He said, because every time, and I never realized this before, Because every time I say, this is my church, this is my ministry, it means I'm responsible for everything. Wow. Wow. Think about that. I think we need to understand that God, and I'm speaking to all of us this morning, has placed us in his church, in his ministry. And whatever God has done in our lives is because he chose us, hallelujah, to be part of his program. Boy, I like that. You're chosen. You're a chosen son and daughter of God, and I like that. I like the thought that the royal blood of Jesus Christ is running through my veins, that he is my king that he is my Lord, and he loved me so much. And listen, you don't know my back life before I came to know Jesus. But that he chose me 
that he reached down in the gutter and pulled me out and he cleansed the sin, the sin that was in my life. And he said, whatever your life plans are, they are changed because I've chosen you to do a work for me. Hallelujah. There is no greater call that you and I can have is to understand that we are chosen of God to do the work that he has called us to do. Now listen, I'm fourth generation pastor. Four generations in my family. And unless something changes, changes that I'm totally unaware of, when the Lord takes me home for good, it will end because there's no more little bobbies running around. You hear that, Elaine? <laughs> but I'm a fourth generation preacher. My grandfather was at Zusa Street when that great move of God took place. So I understand Pentecost. I understand what it's all about. And I had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home. I had the privilege of being part of a very strong, Bible-believing, Pentecostal church that set principles in my heart and my life that I couldn't change. But that doesn't mean that I didn't have a few years of away from God. We're going to have fellowship at Pastor Bob's house this afternoon, I understand. He thinks he's going to watch a baseball game, but see, I used to drive NASCAR. I was one of the good old boys for a period of time, and I enjoyed that. Somebody asked me, do you miss driving a race car? I missed the money that was involved in driving the race car. But you know something? That wasn't the field that God called me to. He called me to preach his word. Can I tell you a quick story? When I went to Bible school, I wasn't saved. I was still away from God. I have no clue how I got there. When they, when, when, the, when they sent me the application and the basic questions, were you saved? I wrote, no. Were you filled with the Holy Spirit? I don't believe in it. And then I had just signed a multi-year contract with NASCAR to race in the big field. I was on my way. And then I received a letter from the Dean of Education of Northeast Bible College. And I opened it knowing that I didn't get in. But I had a Pentecostal grandfather who knew how to pray. And I had a mom and dad that when I was out running around at night and come home 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd walk in the living room and find either my mother, my father, or my grandfather on their knees praying that somehow God would get hold of Sonny. Parents, don't ever stop praying for your kids. No matter what direction they have gone, and don't stop. I'm here only because of that. I opened that letter, and it said, congratulations. <laughs> and I went to school, 21 years old. I couldn't have a car. I was told I couldn't date only once a month. Oh, I, everything was changed. They put me in a room where I had a Pentecostal minister as a roommate. I had one suitcase, this is true, filled with cigarettes, cartons. I was a chain smoker. And the other suitcase had Budweiser. I was ready. My second day of school, they had an opening bomb fire service, and I began to listen to the testimonies. Some of the students that were there around that bomb fire service converted drug addicts, prostitutes, gang leaders, and I wanted to get up and say something, and I couldn't because I wasn't saved. And my church had given me a brand new Thompson chain Bible, but when I left that church, I had that in my hand. I went back to the room by myself, and I closed the door of that. I slammed the door of my dormitory room. I picked up that, I had that brand new Thompson chain Bible, and I literally threw it across the room and watched it come off the wall, put my hand up in the air like this and said, if you're real, you need to save me right now or I'm walking out of this place. And in the next few moments, the power and the presence of God came down, melted my heart, and I gave my life back to Jesus. The next night we had a prayer meeting in the next room next door. 
My roommate was leading that prayer meeting. There was, I don't know, maybe 20 guys in the room. He was talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I knew what was going to happen. They were going to, you know, we did it different in the olden days. Everybody gathered around you, and then one arm would go up in the air, and the other arm would go out in the air, one leg would go out, the other leg would go out, and they all start praying in your ears, and I knew that was going to happen. So when David, his name was David DeMola, pastors of a big church in New Jersey, my roommate said, is anybody here that needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And he looked at me and he said, Bob, God just told me you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that happened. They all gathered around me. One arm went up, the other arm went out, and they were saying whatever. And after about five minutes, See, I'm raised in Pentecost. I know what this is all about. After about five minutes of all this that was going on, with a loud voice I said, get away from me, every one of you. And they all backed up. And I prayed almost the identical prayer that I prayed the night before. Lord Jesus, put my hands up. If this is real, if this needs to be part of my life, do it now. And in those next few seconds, the power and the presence of God settled down on me, and I began to speak in another language and empowered with the Holy Spirit. I understood what my destiny was from that point further. I understood that when my grandfather said to me, you will now preach the word of God when I left to go to Bible school, and you will fulfill the ministry that he has called you to do. That's an awesome responsibility, and it's an awesome call. But I want you to understand, you may not all stand in a pulpit to preach. Or you may not all become missionaries in a foreign country. But the call of God is sacred to you when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, as it is to me. And I'm afraid for today's generation. I'm afraid for today's church because we have left God out of the picture of where we are. You see, we have become spoiled as Christians. We have been given so much, and yet we give so little. I started thinking the other week of some of the things that we have around us to help us in this little world in which we live in. You know, we can go to any grocery store or box store today, and we can buy a product that's stain resistant. Or we can buy another product that's stain proof. Ladies, you're going to like this. You can go to any drugstore or or department store and go to the cosmetic section and get something that will take away your wrinkles. <laughs> now, guys, listen to me. Married guys, listen to me. If your wife comes up to you and say, do you see this wrinkle on your, my face? Do not answer. Yeah, I do see it. <laughs> Don't do that. Or the other thing you'll never do, if your wife comes up to me, up to you, and she's just dressed to go to church, and she says to you, "Is this out? does this outfit make me look heavy? Get on your knees and pray for wisdom before you answer that question. Do not say, yeah, you better change. But we have all these products. We have things that are water resistant. We have things that are waterproof. You can go to the store today and you can buy a product that is fire resistant. And you can go to a store that can buy something that is fireproof. We have all seen these and probably purchased some of these things. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. But maybe we need to focus in on something of interest to God. And that is... Have you found anything yet that's hell-proof? I'm titling this message this morning, Building a Hell-Proof House. Now listen to me. I'm not talking about this building. This is a beautiful sanctuary. It's well-equipped in doing what God has spoken to the pastor's house about. But this is a building. When the rapture takes place, this building is not going. It's staying. You see, we are the church. 
Christ lives in us. And so when I mention those products today, do we have a product that is hell-proof in our life? The reason the church is in trouble in America today is because we have lost the ability to keep his house pure, clean, and hell-proof. Come on. Listen, and I believe that the word of God is going to instruct us before it's too late. I want us to think about it. It's absolutely in God's program to build us to a place where hell will not be able to prevail against us. I haven't thought of this illustration that I'm going to share with you really in a number of years. Some years ago, I was pastoring a church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Nice church. A couple hundred people. Big Christian school. We had over 200 kids in our Christian school. Lots of outreach. One of the outreach ministries is, was once a year, one of the men in our church had a cabin snuggled in the mountains close to where we lived, about two hours out. There was a big, large river that ran past the cabin. And every year, we would go to his cabin, just the men. We would go to his cabin for an overnight time of fellowship and prayer. We look forward to it every year because just the guys would gather. Probably 30, 40 men would show up every year. Tom, who owned the cabin, was a truck driver, big, big wheel, 18-wheel truck driver. And he had taken three of the rear wheels off of one of the trucks and, and welded them together. And that became the pit in which he burned wood. Now, Tom would get to the cabin two or three in the afternoon, and he would start the fire that early. We would usually do this late September, October. So there was a little chill in the air. And as all day long and then into the night hours when the men were arriving, wood would keep going and going into that pit. And usually 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, you could see the red hot embers. I mean, you just placed a piece of dry wood and it would immediately burst into flames. We would sing, and we would do a lot of eating, and we would pray, and we would pray with each other. And usually somewhere in the early morning hours, some of the men would wander off and go into the cabins or into their sleeping areas, and they would sleep. And this one night, it was around 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was still up, and I was still down in front of the fire, pretty much by myself. My assistant pastor was there, and we were just talking and sharing, then it got really quiet, and my assistant, his name was Bob, too. My assistant pastor's name was Bob, and my youth pastor's name was Bob, so we had Bob, Bob, and Rebob. And I, I sat there by myself, and I had become, as it were, transfixed to that fire. It was like I was not there, but just there. And out of that pit, out of that pit, Satan came. And he pulled himself up, and his hands, I'll never forget this, were on the rims that were red hot from the flame. Now you say, what did he look like? He, didn't, he did not have horns. Don't misunderstand this, but he was a handsome, handsome man. And he had the most hideous, hideous laugh that I have ever heard in my life. And he looked at me straight in the eyes, he pointed his fingers at me, finger at me, right in my face. And he called me, preacher, preacher, I will destroy the church by deception. And he laughed and went back to the pit. I want you to think about where the church is today. I want you to think about every wind of doctrine that is floating around in our atmosphere today. I want you to start thinking about some of those who say they are of Jesus and they're not of Jesus. I actually heard a lady interviewed on one of the Christian, quote, television programs last week that is caught up in one of these things and said, God gave me a gold tooth. Right. I don't know where we've come from. I don't recognize the church of Jesus Christ anymore. I recognize it this morning. 
I can see and see the presence of God. I can look at your faces and see God's glory there. So I understand that I'm in a good, safe place this morning. But when I talk to these UM ministers and I listen to what they say, and I ask myself, why on earth, God, did you put me here? And when I talk to one of the pastors, because I'm the wrong person, I'm the wrong person to ask to come preach at a gathering like that. Because you see, I don't compromise God's word. And I'm going to tell it just the way it is. And I'm going to let them know, as one of them called, oh, you're just an old, old school holiness preacher. You're absolutely right. That's exactly who I am. I'm old school. I believe the word of God. I believe in what it says. And I will not compromise the word of God. And I looked at this one lady pastor respectfully, and I said to him, her why are you in the ministry if you don't believe that Jesus Christ went to a cross for your sins? And don't tell me he didn't do it because I've seen him and I've seen the nail prints. I know my Redeemer lives. She said, oh, it's just a story. And I looked at her and I said, why are you in the ministry? Why do you call yourself a pastor? You know what her, you know what her answer was? Because it's a good job. And I said to her boldly, and I am confident as I am ever confident that I will never be asked to go back and speak there again. And I said, then you don't, I said, why are you in the ministry? She says, because it's a good job. You know, I said to her, lady, then you need to know, you need to do the church of Jesus Christ a favor and get out. Because listen to this, Pastor. It's not a job. It's a ministry. And I want to tell you it's the easiest thing that we can do. It is not. You will go through trials and testings and temptations. You will have what it seems like the world come against you. But if you stand strong in the word of God, the scripture says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. And when the children of God, all of us stand, then we will see what God has for us. You know, it bothers me. There's so much talk today about anointing, about power, about revival. But I have to say, and honestly, I don't believe that many of us even understand what those words are. I say that because of what I have seen, what I have witnessed around us. We have more knowledge than we've ever had before. We have more methods than we've ever had before. We've had more methods of being able to promote ministries than we've ever had before. The miracle of radio, the miracle of television, the miracle of computers and the internet and the printed page, and yet in spite of all that we have, we still face the greatest needs we have ever before faced in the history of mankind. AIDS is still at an all-time high with no cure. Drug addiction still at an all-time high and still no cure. In the county in which I live in, in the last two weeks, there has been 25 overdoses of heroin that have taken the lives of those that have overdosed. The American family is broken down as never before. Divorce is not only hitting the world, it's hitting the church, and statistically the divorce in the church today is the same as it is in the world. There's something wrong. What happened to the power of God that changed this Bible? Jesus said that he was going to pour out his spirit in the church You know what true revival is? You know what a true 
move of God is. It's what Jesus wants, a demonstration to the community. Their souls are being brought into the kingdom of God. You know, in history, we analyze things after the fact, but a few years ago, probably 10 or more now, there was a great revival that broke out in Florida in an Assembly of God church. It was uh, the Brownsville revival. People from around the world came. You know how it started? It started when the pastor became desperate before God, and he would go to his church and pray for hours at a time, literally sleep on the front rows of the church, praying in his spirit that God would send a revival. And then an evangelist came, not well known, but God chose him to allow the spirit of God to flow through him, and a revival broke out that lasted for, if I remember right, five years. People from around the world. You know what the key marks of that revival were? that his community was impacted for Christ. So impacted that when the police were out doing their work during the day and at night, the people that they arrested, would not, they would not take them to jail and bring charges against them. They brought them to the revival. Pastor said that he got a call from one of the local principals in the school many weeks into this revival, and he said, we don't understand what's going on. He said, but we have kids from your church that are in the hallways laying on the floor because they're saying that God has slain them in the spirit as they were talking about the power of God. And whole schools were shut down and brought to this revival because of the power of God that was taking place. And I'm not here to argue the, the history and when we look into that, the things that were right or the things that were wrong. But during that course of time, there was no magical gold dust that came out of the air vents. There were not people falling on the floor and rolling around in what they called the spirit. There were not those kind of supernatural things that really were not of God, but there was a genuine move of God that touched hearts. And many years after that revival is over, that church is still a thriving church, witnessing and bringing forth the power of God. And listen, I've come here today to say to even you, and this church I believe is awake, but awaken to a greater place that God has for you and become all that God has for you. Let this church not be in, impacted by a man who is a man of God. And you have a man of God as a pastor in this church, but let this community be impacted by the power of God. You want to fill every uh, seat in this building? Just get somebody healed. Just let the power of God begin to demonstrate that the lame can walk and the blind can see and lives can be changed and heroin addicts and drug addicts can be delivered in a moment, in a moment, by the power of God. The Apostle Paul was a tent maker. I'm a bus driver part-time. And one of the things that breaks my heart is every Monday and Wednesday, I have to go to the methanol treatment place. And I have an early morning run out two days a week. I go to work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I can tell you by 6 o'clock in the morning, there's 100 to 200 young people standing at that methanol place to get their, their, their fix of drugs to take them through the next couple of days. It breaks my heart. Because there was an answer, and the answer is not drugs. The answer is Jesus Christ. I understand that if we lay hands on someone's addicted, they can be set free in a moment. I have to tell you that I, it sickens my spirit when I see so many of our people, Christian people, sickened with diseases. When my Bible says that by your stripes we are healed, dear God, give us the authority, give us the power to be able to walk down the aisles of our church and anoint them and lay hands on them and we see them recover. Let us go to the hospitals and say, in the name of Jesus, cancer dry up. Let the power of God once again be manifested in our lives. How do we do that? Because by becoming a vessel where hell cannot have its way in our life. We do not have to succumb to the evilness of sin or hell because we are delivered children of God. Hallelujah. Talk to the church. I believe today that the problem in the church is that we become lulled to sleep with a dead religion on one side and a circus sideshow on the other side. 
we have the church on a dead church on one side of the ditch and the show on the other side of the ditch. I shared this with Pastor last night over dinner. One of our daughters and her husband was home for Easter. They wanted to go to one of the new churches. That's the fad today. They don't have a pastor, pastor, big pastor. They have a campus pastor. He takes care of all the midweek services and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a big screen, and, and there's another person who's the, who's the main pastor. He pastors, I don't know, six, seven, maybe 12 churches. Went into this church, nice building. Ceilings were painted black in recessed lights, turned way down light, almost like you're going to a movie theater. Walked into the church, the greeters greeted us, very friendly, very nice. I think it's one of those seeker sensitive things. Ushered us to our seats, and stood in front of us and said, what would you like to drink? We have cold water, we have coffee, we have tea, and if you would like a bagel or a donut, we'll provide you with that. And, you know, there's sometimes when I have to, Elaine will hit me in the side, keep your mouth shut. I didn't go to church to have breakfast. I went to get fed by the word. You know? So I said, no, thank you. Can I tell you I appreciate your worship team? The glory of God is seen in their faces. The piano player is a little. The worship team. They have a countdown like you do. Worship team was up there five minutes before, all set to go. Hits the hour, and they're right into worship. The worship leader, blue jeans, shirt hanging out of his jacket or pants, baseball hat on backwards. Now my fire is up. I know. Don't, don't come to me and say, Pastor Bob, God looks at the heart, not the outward appearance. Thank God for that scripture. But I'm not God, so I look at the outward appearance. A couple of the beautiful young ladies that were leading worship. I later found out that they actually went out and bought these pants. Blue jeans that had slits cut all the way down the leg. And when the pastor spoke, he really spoke of not too much on Easter Sunday about the cross, but about the Easter money. And he instructed the campus pastor to do what he does and take the Reese's chocolate peanut butter cups and throw them out to the congregation as we celebrate Jesus. Well, I was celebrating, but, you know, keep my mouth shut. You see, that's not the church. You see, I struggle with that. Because the church is a place where people need to be saved. And I have a further word for you today, church. It's not just for we can, it's a place where we come and get fed. Thank God you have a pastor that feeds you and feeds you well. But the church is not a haven for saints. It's a place of refuge for sinners. It's a place where the drug addict can find deliverance and be set free. It's a, it's a place of, it, 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 it's a place of where the alcoholic can be set free. And it's a place where if you come to church or people come to church because there's a need that those needs can be met in their lives. Every single day I struggle with what I see in the world. Part of my bus driving is in an area that's down and out. And apart from the drug addicts and the prostitutes, prison parolees, because we have a prison where I work, and parolees, the prison parolees are out there. And I watch every single day as I come into the main transportation area and have to sit for up to 20 minutes. I watch all the things that happen in the world happen right there. In spite of the cameras, in spite of everything, it's done. You think of the worst things that can happen in public, and it's done with no remorse. And I see a beautiful young lady who's hopeless and trapped in drug addiction, sells her body for mere peanuts so that she can have the next fix. 
and I listen to their methadone treatments, and I listen to the other things that they try to get help from. And they say to me, my supervisors say to me, don't you talk to them about religion or God. And I look at them and say, try and stop me. I'm going to tell you a story that broke, broke my heart. We have a lot of Mexican, Hispanics, Haitians that are in that area. We are, our state is a chicken producing, they have chicken producing plants. We have Purdue, we have Mountain Air that, that do 80 to 100,000 processes of chickens a day. A lot of the folks that are illegal come and they work there because they can work there for nothing, but they want to be part of this country. Everybody on my bus knows that I'm a pastor. And this very beautiful young lady gets on the bus along with her mother, both illegals. And they're very open about that. Somebody said, another pastor asked me a question, and they addressed me as Pastor Bob. And this young lady got out of her seat, and she walked up to where I was driving, and she said to me, you pastor? And I said, yes. And big tears began to run down her face. And she says to me, I'm a Christian girl, and I love my Jesus very much. And she says, but I'm in this country illegally, and I'm afraid that I'm going to get deported. And so, pastor, would you pray? that somehow God would fix it so I could stay here. You know, I have, we have four daughters, so, you know, I'd adopt the whole world if you let me. And then she continued her story and her mother sitting right there next to her. She said, my mother says to me, the only way that I can stay in this country is to get pregnant. And she said, because if I get pregnant in America, in this state, I don't know if it was in your state, but in our state, the state will let you stay. They'll take care of all the prenatal, take care of the birth thing, and because that child will become an American citizen, the mother can now stay. And she says, my God tells me I need to be pure girl. I want Christian man in my life, and I really don't want to go back deported, so please pray for me that God would help me. I hadn't seen her or him, her and her mother for, I don't know, three, four, five months. Just a couple of weeks ago, she got on the bus. She looked at me, and I looked at her. She was very pregnant. Tears streaming down her face said to me, my mother paid her friend who raped me so that I would become pregnant and I could stay in this country. And she says, now I am unpure in the sight of God. I was at what we call the hub where we all come in. And believe me, we're not supposed to do what we do, what I did. But I got out of my seat and I walked around to where she was. And I took her in my arms. And I said, please understand, that I'm a daddy, and I have four daughters. And I let her hug this pastor, and I felt her tears on my collar and on my shirt and on my face. And I, let, I assured her, I said, do you still love Jesus? She says, more than ever before. I said, in his eyes, you are still pure. You still belong to him. You're his child. Don't let it loose of that. And then her mother tried to step on the bus. And boy, did I rebuke that spirit. She didn't ride on my bus that day. Let me tell you something, folks. As a church, we have to act. As a church, we have to act. Because the whole world is filled with this stuff. And we need to get out into the highways and byways and do the work that God's called us to do so that hell can't take a life of a precious young lady. I don't know why I'm going down this road today. 
when we were in Israel, we bought a bunch of little souvenir crosses made of the same wood that Jesus' cross was made of. Uh, we bought a bunch of them just to give out to people. Another gentleman on my bus working at the chicken plant on parole, a heroin user, who every day we say, stay another day cleaner, Pastor Bob, and they stayed another day cleaner. I was down to one of those crosses left. Quite honestly, I was going to keep it myself. I give away more than I keep. The Lord impressed me to give it to him. So I gave him that cross. I explained what it was all about. He said he loved the Lord, prayed with him. He thanked me over and over and over again. He said, a little piece of wood, a little cross that represents Christ. Every time I saw him, he had that cross in his hand. I hadn't seen him in a while. And I asked one of the other gentlemen who lives in the same house with me. I said, where is Andrew? I haven't seen him. He said, we found Andrew dead just a couple days ago. And he said the needle was still in his arm. But he said something strange. He said a cross, a wooden cross was in his other hand. And all his note says is, Father, forgive him. Did I do enough? Was giving him just a wooden cross and praying with him enough? You see, I'm the church. And it has to be more than worship more than praise, it has to be something that changes your life and my life. And we have to get to a place where hell does not affect us. When people tell me, no, I can't do something, and it's right what God tells me to do, in spite of the consequences, you stand for God. Because the moment I give in to the devil, is the moment that he's going to come back again with something greater, and then greater, and then greater, till he has victory in my church. He's not going to have it. Many of God's children have looked at what's going on in the church and have become involved in it. Because we lack the power of God in our lives. And I say this with all my heart. I say it because I'm here this morning as a pastor speaking to this church. I'm saying it's time that we go back. I'm saying to the word of God to see what God is saying about the situation in our church. I'm going to close my remarks with this. The world will never be reached by a church that is not on fire for God. I was in a church two weeks ago where people are leaving by the droves because the power of God I've talked to your pastor. I know his vision. I see what he's doing in other countries around the world through missions. And I would say to Pastor Bob and Linda, and to the members of this church, and to the deacons and the board members, and Sunday school teachers and the youth leaders, or whoever you all are, you're doing a great job in New Bedford, Massachusetts. But I'm here to tell you there's a greater work that can be accomplished. I want you to invite me back next, next year, Pastor Bob. And I want to see every seat filled. I want you to Skype me or FaceTime me like we do two or three times a week. And say to me, Pastor Bob, hell has lost its place. And we're going to go to a bigger facility. 
because of the people being saved and because of the people that are being impacted and by my community. I want to hear this pastor say, some people were arrested this week and they didn't take them to jail. They brought them to church to be set free. I want to hear this church say, because this church has that potential. I want to hear Pastor Bob say, one of my members went to the hospital to pray somebody for somebody who, who was dying of cancer. And they're home cancer free. I want to see the miracles of God happen again because that's what's going to fill the church. And we need to obey God when he speaks to us. And you know, somebody said to me, well, you're a miracle-believing person. I am. But if I go to church and I pray for somebody and I don't see that miracle, it does not change the way I am. Because I'll continue to pray until I see the miracle. Because that's what God's all about. Change New Bedford for Jesus. I have, uh, and Elaine and I have appreciated the room that you provided for us because it overlooks the water. And I see all those fishing boats. You know what I think would be nice? That the next time, and if we get a room like that the next time, to look out across the water instead of seeing the Lazy Jane, to see a boat that says, Fishers of Men. And that's what we're all about, church. Don't let hell have victory in your life. No matter what your struggle, no matter what your circumstance, don't let hell have victory in your life. And don't be afraid of Satan. Because there's one thing that Satan knows. Now listen to me. He's smart. But he's not the smartest kid on the block. He was thrown out of heaven. Remember that. Understand that. Well, there's one thing that Satan knows. He knows that we are living in the last of the last days. He knows that his reign on earth is almost over. So he has released all the demons in hell to come against the church. But if we will stand strong in the things of God, we'll send him back to the pit from whence he came with a final victory of his destruction. Because we have the victory in Jesus Christ. Jesus said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Know who you are in Jesus, and nothing, but nothing, but nothing can come against you. God bless you. Amen. How many believe what he just preached? That means I'll see you on Monday night. Because you will not do what he said without prayer. Prayer is the most important uh, program we have. <clears throat> Prayer is us coming together collectively, praying, binding the powers of the enemy, amen, and seeing people set free. Um, the other day I was on a ride, oops, I was on a ride along the police department. I was there for six hours, and we arrested this young lady for shoplifting, and um, she was on drugs. She was in her 50s. And my heart just went out to her, and I wanted to tell her about Jesus, but I'm kind of, my hands are kind of tied in that situation. I have to be careful. But I prayed for her, and I said, Lord, you know, somehow give us an opportunity to see her saved. There's tons of people like that. You know, we go to, we go to Walmart, we drive by Walmart. We don't think of these things. But people are getting arrested, people are getting high, people are getting, you know, Overdosed, I think there was uh, several overdoses in, in New Bedford, Behaven. And it's a continual thing. And we can reach out to them, but we've got to have the power. That's right. We can't reach out in psychology. We can't reach out, you know. We've got to reach out with the power of God. 
we believe that we have the power of God and God has given us that power. You know, I love that scripture that he was sharing about Jesus said, uh, Peter, upon this rock, what was the rock? It wasn't Peter. <clears throat> the, walk, the rock was the revelation of who Christ was. That's right. Because previous he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. You are the son of God. And I don't care what demon in hell will come and try to teach our, our children in school through Islam that Jesus is not the son of God. He is the son of God. He we proved to be the Son of God, Romans says, by his resurrection. He is the Son of God. And so by that power, let's stand and, and be uh, counted for this last day revival that God is going to bring to the church. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand in closing. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the preacher, Lord. We, we open an invitation next year for him to come back. Maybe before next year. <clears throat> in fact... Uh, we don't know, but it could possibly be that he may be pastoring close by us soon. And if that's the case, he can come up more often. And uh, I just love Pastor Bob and Elaine, and I thank you for coming, being a part and imparting to our life this morning. And Father, we thank you for Sajiv, and we thank you for his ministry. We thank you for what you're going to do in India, what you're going to do, oh, Father, in that region, oh, Father, those people that are so demonically entrapped by demon powers. But, God, you're going to set them free in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we're going to see a great revival in New Bedford. And, Father, we're going to see this place filled in the name of Jesus. And we thank you and we praise you for all that you're going to do and all that you're going to do through us. Because, Lord, it's not so much us doing it as it is you doing it through us and us allowing you to do it through us. It's dying to self. And allowing the resurrected Christ to live his life through us. And we thank you and we praise you, Father. Now, as we go our separate ways, be with those who are not with us today, that are sick in body, that have asked for prayer. Lord, for George and, and Tia and the baby, we pray, God, that you'll touch them right where they are, Father. Lord, those who may not be here because of sickness today, Father, we pray that you would heal them for Tara and her baby. And for Ariana, touch them and heal them, Father, in the name of Jesus and others. We pray, God, that you will heal today. And, Father, we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor this morning. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Greet one another before you do leave. Don't leave without greeting each other.